Okay, welcome everybody to Open Ground. The first, this is our first event. Look, the technology's working. You can hear me okay, Stephen? Yep, perfectly. Okay, okay, I'm fairly loud, so. Okay, so the whole point of this first event was to give, obviously, our young entrepreneurs who are on the beginning, some more through their uh, journey than others, uh, some insight into what it's like and to get um, some understanding and some. I guess tips and tricks, etc., from people who have been there or are in it, etc. So I've managed to get a range of males and females, which is great. But light on the ground with my female contacts this year, so make up for that. Enjoy it today, boys, because this is it's very male dominated from here. So this panel discussion, um, I went to an event like this uh, late last year, run by the Ice House at Massey Uni. Uh, and so I, I stole their idea, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Tied down those roofs, mate, but anyway. Still a little more. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. So I've got, I've got nine questions, which I won't ask everybody to answer every question because we could be here all day. So we'll just try to, you know, alternate. Um, but first of all, if I can just get our six entrepreneurs just to give them some, give a bit of an intro, who they are, what they're doing, where they've been, and, and we'll go from there. So, should we start with you, Stephen? Sure thing. Um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Leaney. Um, I am an East West Lake boy, finished up in 2008. Um, I'm currently based in Winnipeg, Canada. Um, so where my partner's from, uh, we hadn't been home in a long time, hence why we're over here. Um, it's been around about minus 25 for the last month or so, so a little bit chillier than uh, what's happening over in NZ at the moment. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're coming home as soon as the borders reopen, which is exciting. Um, yeah, I, I am the founder and director of Abstract Digital. Um, so we're a performance digital marketing agency, um, primarily based in Auckland. Um, but uh, my team is based across New Zealand, Australia and the UK um, and we also work with clients um, across a fairly wide uh, array of industries but primarily in tech, uh, manufacturing and trade services across New Zealand, Australia and the UK. Um, so yeah, very much technology based business um, working pretty much entirely online um, and yeah, the, the, the business was founded in October of 2020. Um, so we're about a year, just under a year and a half in, um, and uh, yeah, absolutely loving it. Cool. And I taught Simon, uh, Stephen, sorry, in my first, <laughs> so my first two years at Westlake, and he had this massive blonde girly hair for <laughs> That especially when you set up. And it's all gone now. Yeah, when you set up scenes with the year twelve, so you always knew where Stephen Lee was because this big blonde fro was uh, on show. Yeah, she was pretty large. <laughs> okay. Okay, Tim. Um, yeah, I was uh, an ex-Westlake boy um, in 2013, so pretty recent. Uh, and um, I went to uni here, did commerce, uh, and initially tried to intern at KPMG, found it really boring, uh, and then started my own uh, suit, oh, custom suit business right out of uni. Um, and we grew that to some of the most custom suits at New Zealand um, in three years. And then um, uh, also, yeah, in the last year and a half, um, I've been working on a, uh, an app. Um, it's an investing app. Uh, it's called Sugar Wallet. Um, and it essentially allows people to um, automatically invest every paycheck. Um, so imagine like Kiwi Saver, but you can withdraw at any time. Um, it's as simple as like picking growth, balance, um, conservative, and you, just, you don't have to think about it. Uh, you don't have to pick a stock, or you don't have to um, do research and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, um, that that's a bit done. Also, talk, do you have any of the name price? Oh yeah, three. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, one thing I do want to say that's really important. Um, um, which I'm not sure if it will be asked today or not, but um, because um, I had an awesome year 13 business school, a uh, business studies teacher, um, that actually led to me getting funding 
um, or angel funding for my business. Um, if it wasn't for Karen, I had never, I would have never met Bill Smale. I would have never gotten funding. Um, I would have never gotten exposed to Young Enterprise. So, yeah, I just want to say a big thanks. Hi, Sorry, sorry. I was just going to ask, what is angel funding? Um, <laughs> Well, I, I'm sitting next to a VC, but uh, so uh, hopefully it's not a horrible definition. But um, <laughs> it'll become clear shortly why we're all laughing. Um, generally, uh, an angel comes right at the start. Um, so when when companies or when founders, um, so people who start companies, uh, take money from investors, um, angels come right at the start. The reason why they're angels is typically um, they don't necessarily do the same hard, gritty analysis that you might have a venture capitalist do. A venture capitalist comes a little bit later. Um, and an angel typically backs people, um, and backs people for like who they believe in and, and the idea that they believe in. So that's nice. So it's not necessarily the business idea, it's more just the um, person? Or? Uh, not necessarily. There is okay. definitely like, I mean, I, you wouldn't necessarily back an entrepreneur um, if you love them and they're starting something that you don't believe in at all. Okay. Um, so, like the bill, it was his personal connection to seeing ASB rewards, um, seeing how he could swipe his card all the time and just see all the small savings add up. Um, to him, that's what connected to our idea. Uh, so an angel, an angel will still have some sort of interest in your idea. And a big question in the time of years as well. Oh, so sorry. You, no, no, you're right, but if something pops in, we'll write it down here. How'd you do? Um, hi, I'm Naya. I'm not a hacks West Lake boy, so I'm, uh, um, I originally was a, a subatomic physicist, and I worked on the Shot Challenger program in Orlando, and so blew up. And then I came to New Zealand and um, sold technical computing products like computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis. I then ended up running the Young Enterprise team for six years, which is where I met Karen. Uh, teaching people how to start businesses, and I spent the last 20 years working with startups. I now run a deep tech fund, so we invest in technology companies, but actually we invest in the people, and the technology company is a given. So we can like all the tech, but we have to want to support the people, and then we support them through to the end. Um, we have four filters on our business, and one of those is that we, what we invest in must be doing good in the world. It has to improve the planet all the way people live. So very clearly, we're not just here to make money. Uh, so my name is Cleo, I am the director and founder of BPO, which is a risk management firm. I've been going for about almost two years now. Um, I was a university dropout but spent 13 years in the legal sector, finding my way up law firms um, before going out on my own. So really it's nice to be here. Cool. Hello everyone, my name is Emma. Um, I have a company called Alpha AML Training and we do anti-money laundering training, helping businesses to train their staff how to spot money laundering and stop financial crime. Um, I started out um, at university, I did science and business, and then I was working in intellectual property law. Um, after about four years of that, I quit, <laughs> and um, after a bit of travel overseas, I decided to get into entrepreneurship. Um, and so I've been running my company for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, and yeah, great to be here. Cool, thank you. Hi everyone, um, have a good day. I also work you can, you can take them off if you want to do it. So I work with Nayo at uh, Nuance Capital and my role is investment manager. So I think it's one of the best roles you can sort of have if you're interested in entrepreneurship. We get to see a range of ideas, um, different types of entrepreneurs, and we select for us many process that Nayo mentioned and support them for their journey. So helping them either start their business or if, if they already got a startup, then we help to see um, uh, what sort of resources, people, technology, money they need for them to go to the next step to sustain it. Um, my background is science, so I was a, um, a biologist, <laughs> but it was quite boring, didn't want to be in a lab. Um, so my career path has taken me to pretty much reviewing science and engineering technologies, hence that term deep tech that um, and I use. 
I've also uh, started a program called um, SINS, so Social Innovation um, New Zealand. It's at university level, so it's for students who are quite interested in um, social impact ventures, so things that are good for the planet. Um, and it was a program like you're running, taking them through nine weeks, ten weeks um, journey, validating the idea, um, seeing how you bring the idea to market, and how you guys it. I was also a judge for this program. I think we need to go to it. Yeah. 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 Cool. So a few range of um, experience and industries. So, <coughs> next question. What was your inspiration? So we'll head over to Stephen for that. What was your inspiration, Stephen, um, for starting a business? Yes, I mean, inspiration kind of uh, was grounded in like an interest in technology. Um, my career path like uh, dropped out of university um, because I just wasn't quite sure where I was heading. Uh, started working at JB Hi-Fi, selling technology, realized I really enjoyed technology, moved into uh, the distribution space for technology and then um, went traveling for a while and got into Australia um, and uh, yes, yeah, started working in the digital marketing space there, uh, kind of combining a bit of a passion for marketing um, and a passion for technology. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the, the, I suppose, like what really kind of drove me there is, is, that, is that combination of marketing and tech. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the digital marketing space is, is pretty fascinating. So. Uh, really kind of grew from there. Um, when I got back to New Zealand in uh, March 2020, um, just before the pandemic hit, um, the, I was planning on going traveling while growing uh, my freelance business, um, where I just had a couple of digital marketing clients already with me. Um, but the pandemic hit, obviously, um, and uh, yeah, I basically just started organically picking up a few more clients as I went. Um, and uh, that kind of really showed me, I suppose, that you know I had a skill set that facilitated me being able to work for myself. Um, so it got a little bit later in the year of, of 2020 um, and had picked up a few more clients. Um, so it kind of came to the point where having a full-time job plus the client base I had would have been uh, incredibly busy uh, and probably too much. So I made the decision to, I suppose, really kind of go forward um, you know, and, and back myself. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I suppose, like the, the, the journey that it took me to get there. Um, it was about identifying my passion for, you know, broader kind of industry speaking. And then once getting into that industry, working really, really, really hard to understand as much as I could about it so that I could then be in a position to have my own clients, do my own work and, and, and back myself. Uh, mine was a, an introduction actually, so um, I met uh, through my last job, I was working at another startup um, in, in more of an operations type role, and I had professional connections through that job, um, a lawyer actually, and um, we, it was part of my professional network, and he introduced me to some other guys who were interested in getting involved with this anti-money laundering idea. Um, and so that was what led us to get on the whiteboard and to come up with the idea that turned into Alpha AML, uh, which is my business. So a bit of a, a different um, connection or way, way to start um, than, than Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great who you meet um, through business and often it's people that you meet and who you network with that can, you can end up doing a lot of business with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Cleo, what was your inspiration? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I've worked in law firms for about 13 years, um, yeah, not a qualified lawyer, but worked my way up to a very senior level where I didn't know you can actually um, become a partner in a law firm without a law degree, we researched that because that was an option for me. Um, so I actually went into more of a GM role as a kind of like operations and, and growth of the business and we led a series of change management projects for the law firm to kind of modernise and because um, a lot of law firms are quite old fuddy duddies so we kind of like bring modernisation and digitisation and all those other things. Um, so during the first lockdown my team did amazingly, they just took rain um, and we were already prepared for uh, an event like that with my risk management experience. Um, so I knew it was time to go so I quit 
my job um, in the first lockdown. It, the partners were like, don't do this. We don't know where everything's headed. I was like, I need to leave. It's time for me to go. The team's ready to step up. Um, and I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, so from there, this has all happened quite organically where I've moved into the risk management space. And I support um, companies with their change management or implementation of their risk and compliance or operation functions. Um, yeah, and it's just been a series of bringing my skills to market and the market has spoken to me and told me what it wants. Yeah, cool. And I actually met Cleo last, oh God, I don't even know now, the last couple of years of learning to one. Cleo did a feasibility study for the West Lake West High School Foundation for this program. And so I still go back with importance to the original document that you produced, make sure that I have a couple of bases, I look at the risks. So yeah, that's how I met Cleo. So you just you never know who you're going to, to come across. Thomas, question? So your company, BPO, does risk assessment, is that? Correct? Yeah, we, we do risk assessments. We also um, create infrastructure for operations, and then we also design risk and compliance frameworks for businesses as well, and also for startups or Okay, um, so when so you said you started, you founded it two years ago? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how long did it take for you to get, you know, uh, <laughs> how, did, how long did it take for you to get on, you know, off the ground, you know, just? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm quite a aggressive mm -hmm. with um, sales, like I'll, make, I'll, I'll do a lot of things that other people are not willing to do, so I chucked, you know, unprofessional videos on LinkedIn that were not beautifully designed. Like, I, I remember with the feasibility study, like they weren't ready to go, and I was like jumping on Zoom, like, when are we gonna get this going? Um, so I'm always getting in front of people and just like, if I need to know someone, I'll hound them until they'll speak to me. Um, I get rejected about 100 times a day. It's really good for um, your ego and growth, um, and it has humbled me a lot, but that's what's gotten things going, and it's about, you know, if someone doesn't want to work with you, I'll, that's okay, but I want to know why and, um, you know, how can we work together without me having to cut my prices. Okay. So you're constantly taking feedback? Yep. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you a lot from this little session today. Okay, I'm going to go to the next question, and I'm going to start with Dev on this one. How different is your business today from people when it started? Yeah, awesome question. Um, uh, Joker Wallet, um, when we first started, um, we were going to initially copy the idea um, of an app called Plum in the UK um, and Acorns in the US, uh, which was like, you know, round up every transaction. So, like, you go and buy coffee, coffee costs, say, like $4.50, round up 50 cents, invest that away or save that away. Um, but, um, Two things led me to, to change. Um, one was uh, I spent about four months doing something called problem discovery, which is essentially just the process of really understanding the problem you're solving. Um, when I first um, when I first um, came up with the idea of this like automated automated investing app, I didn't really think about the problem I was solving that much. I thought I knew what the problem was, um, I, and my level of understanding was as deep as um, investing is complicated. Um, but I didn't really understand like why, for who, um, uh, and yes, I uh, spent about four months um, interviewing hundreds of people, serving hundreds of people, um, doing these things called concierge tests, which are like imagine literally being a concierge to someone, like um, uh, someone, for example, would be like, I have no idea how much I'm spending on Uber Eats. So I would have their bank transactions, I whip up a report and show them how much they're spending on um, Uber Eats, um, uh, and, and all sorts of things. And eventually I found what people were willing to pay for the most and what was the most painful problem. Um, and that led me to realizing that, wait a minute, the investing piece is getting the most um, painful reactions where, um, like context, my mom uh, had 11 years of KiwiSaver on anti-default, 
as you earn 1% a year. Um, and making that sort of change in five minutes um, uh, for people who had bank savings um, meant a lot. So essentially, uh, for people who had never invested before, despite the likes of a Shazies, despite the likes of a Hatch, um, we essentially targeted those people. So that's the second we went after. And we went after um, just taking a percentage of someone's paycheck and investing that away into a fund. Um, so that's where we ended up at. Um, and also another thing that you have to keep in mind is um, if you're building a technology product or even um, actually a non-technology product, um, scope is a big thing. Um, when we first uh, decided, when we raised money, we were like, we're going to go and build out these four gigantic features, which was like saving, investing, budgeting, and um, cashbacks from like swiping your card. And then we had engineering hit on us and be like, uh, yeah, we can't do this in four months. So we had to de-scope um, down to the single most important thing to start with. Um, you can't build everything. You have to build one thing to start with. So, yeah. Oh, no, no. Um, slightly different answer. Uh, Warren Buffett said if you've got an hour to ask questions, you should spend, sorry, an hour to, to pitch, you should spend the first 55 minutes asking questions to find the problem. And that's what I heard from Dev is what, what problem am I actually trying to solve? So I've been investing for 12 years for a single high net worth individual, lovely guy. But New Zealand has a, an issue in deep tech, specifically deep tech, so science, engineering, like, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and intellectual property, in that there is not a fund that was focusing on that but focused on the founders and the people and help the founders get to where they were going. So I knew we had a gap in the market and I needed a business partner. And I waited three years after my business partner asked me to join them in the business to make sure that he was the right one. And there a whole bunch of due diligence. Talk to me about you know, the, the grit. Um, we have accused VCs of looking at a lot of dirt before we invest. We do. We look at everything, but we spend most of our time on you. And we look at who else you know and who's in your ear, who your advisors are, and at your level that's often a parent. And then we look at what your parents have done to see whether they know what they're talking about. Um, and then we look at the intellectual property and we look at the market size and we look at the technology. So knowing that I wanted to do that by like best practice from the top down was my motivation for starting Nuance, which we started in May last year after three years of time. But the, very specifically, we wanted a business that would solve the actual problem of being able to support founders with good technology in a best practice way. And has it changed? Your business changed at all? Well, we only started in May last year, so yeah. it's changed drastically from 10 years ago when I was invested into what we're doing now. Yeah. Um, the difference in the last eight months is we've brought Natalia on board and our standards have gone up even higher. Mm -hmm. Which is best practice for people who have seen Cool. So okay. when, when did you start, sorry? We started officially, we launched on May in May last year. We're raising a $60 million fund and we kicked off with $35 million. We've now got another $23 million, so we've done quite well at filling it. Okay. But yeah, the fund is bigger than it was when we started, mm -hmm. and we have a few more processes and policies than we know they won. Um, and we have government funding too. The government backed us and put some money in right. so that we can help entrepreneurs. So when you invest in you know, entrepreneurs, yeah. I know because you are a business, do you still, do you take a, is it like Shark Tank in a way that you would say, uh, we'll give you this amount of money for five cents taking your business? Categorically, normally that's an angel thing. So angel is seed stage, it's the very first money you get. Venture capital is a little bit after that. So somebody else has gone in and said, here Thomas, I'll take your business, I'll give you $10,000 to 10% and you can sweet, I'll take it. And then we come in and go, we think your business is worth this, we're going to put this much in and we're going to bring some other investors in. So you will end up with this much percent and everybody else will invest. Right, okay. Okay. Okay, so what are the key factors that were important for business growth? And I'll start with... Echoing um, everyone's point here is the people. So um, as the uh, other entrepreneurs, we call them founders or co-founders if it's more than one. Um, can they take in the feedback? from like what Peter said and Dave said. Are they able to take in the feedback, react to um, the market? Are they actually building a product that the market wants? So there's this thing that angel investors mostly say, it's like don't fall into a trap where it's like build it and they'll come, versus your customers and investors. So build a product, start off with what they've said, like something small, 
um, and then can you scale it, which is the growth. Take in your market feedback and this is feedback to growth. Why is investors feedback important? Because they want their returns. They're putting in money to get their returns. You need angel investment first, then you go to VC. So you're always constantly raising until you're self-sustainable or your company's self-sustainable at the growth stage. So the most key, key important factor is people, the market, um, and that the product is built for the market. And this, the third key one is, can you protect your competitive advantage in the marketplace? So can someone else replicate what you're doing quite easily? What that means for you is you probably lose customers. Um, what that means for investors that have invested in you is they might not get the returns that they're looking for. So it doesn't have to be patents. I don't know if you've come across that. But something that would keep you in the market for longer and compete and grow. Um, and I guess also attract talent. Because when you want to grow your company, you need to grow your team and you want to get some of the best people on board and they, you want them to choose you over what else might be available on the market. So for us, it's those three things. Um, that's where I spend a lot of my time, the number of viewing opportunities that get pitched to us from entrepreneurs. Those are the three things we look for because that's the first one. Can I, can I add to that? When Natalie said attract talent, when we invest in someone, I mean, you might come and pitch to us and say, we invest in my business. My first question is, would I work for you? I'm not going to, but the next good person who comes along will be asking that question. So are you self-aware? Are you coachable? Are you following what's happening in the market? So that's a really important question that we ask mm -hmm. of our founders. It's what I would do. Interesting, because what if we just do a day or two ago, we did some work on self-awareness. Stephen, same question for you. What, what do you think the key factors are for, um, that are important for growth of your business? Uh, I think output is a really key one. Um, you know, like Priya was saying before, sales, sales is, is king or queen. Um, you know, if you're not selling, then you're not bringing on new business and you're not growing. Um, your, your ability to output the different things that are going to help drive business growth. So, you know, people, like, it, like everyone has said so many times, you know, like the people that you meet, the people that you put yourself in front of are going to help your business grow. Uh, the people that you have internally that you select to work with you, that you hire, you know, they're going to help you grow because you need that support system, uh, you know, working with you to help drive growth. Uh, and then, yeah, your, you know, your output in terms of like actually, um, you know, putting your business in front of its target audience or its target market and positioning it well enough listening to that feedback from you know the market and what the market's actually telling you you know you might think and this is what Dave was saying you might think that you've got you know the perfect product you go to market and the market says oh, it's not a bad product but this would be perfect if you hear that multiple times you need to have that adaptability to go okay for us to really achieve solid growth we need to listen to what the market's telling us so that adaptability uh, and that output and the people, uh, I'd say would probably be my, my, those key three factors to really kind of drive growth. Um, you know, if you, as a founder, if you want it, you need to go out and get it. Um, you know, so you need to be going out and you need to be selling, you need to be networking, you need to be talking to people, you need to be talking to the market. Um, and yeah, you need to, you need to put yourself in, in a place that facilitates that growth. Awesome. Okay, so the next question is, what was your biggest challenge that you had to overcome? And I'm going to start with Emma. In terms of in my business? Yeah, in my business. Journey? Any of them. Perhaps your business, getting a few. Yeah, um, biggest challenge? Probably, um, <laughs> in getting it started. Pro I think that one of the biggest challenges I face is I run my business on my own. Um, and so when I started my business, um, there was many, many months of working by myself, <laughs> um, doing a lot of research. I made training content for, so I do uh, obviously uh, money laundering training, so it was hundreds of hours of putting these modules together. It was a lot of late nights, and I was isolated, you know? And sometimes being an entrepreneur is a bit like that. <laughs> um, so I would say just, pushing through with that, um, having resilience and knowing that you met yourself and, and you, you know, you're know you onto a good idea, um, and, and pushing through those early stages of yeah the, the hard work, the graph, doing it on your own to get a product to market to the point where somebody's going to buy it from you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
Oh, because a lot of a lot of the boys in here are on their own at the moment. Yeah. Leo. Uh, not having enough money. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Because I'm a single mom as well, so I'm fully responsible for financially supporting my son, and I lived like a really good job um, to earn zero money, so I had zero dollars coming in at the beginning, um, and poured all my savings into startups. So I had to learn to balance my energy so that I had a good amount of money flow coming. Um, and like when you're worried about your day-to-day -day expenses, it's really hard to think creatively and think of growth opportunities. So I had to really like drill down and be like, like it got to the point where I was like, okay, I've got this much time before my money runs out. <laughs> I have to like go get a job. So there was that real like high volatility in the beginning. Um, it's a bit better now, but in the effort and now work, like I'm turning away work at the moment, which is okay. hard as well. Yeah. So it's a good position to be in, but right at the beginning when you've got no money, you've got other um, responsibilities, I found that really challenging. And no. So I'm in a similar position that you will find yourselves in, in that I started a business from scratch, which means that I'm building a business, I'm building a product, and hiring people, and pitching for funds all at the same time. Pitching for funds is a full-time job, building a business is a full-time job, running a business is a full-time job. So you have three full-time jobs on the plate. And it's about priorities and where you spend your energy and when you spend your energy. So, you know, working from 6 till 10 writing policies might be okay at night, but working from 6 in the morning till 9 a.m. in the morning writing policies might not be as productive for you. So it's about, I've got a lot to do, very long hours, like, like they are, very long hours. <laughs> but it's about you've got more than one thing to focus on and it's where you put your energy and time. And when you are pitching for a business and running a business, we're very conscious that our entrepreneurs are doing that because we're also doing that until the end of March. Um, and it's just, you know, what gets your attention today. And not forgetting any of the 412 things I've to do just keeps getting on. Um, I also suffered a, another challenge, which is that I'm female and I'm in a deep tech field and I'm no longer 20, don't say anything, and um, convincing people to give me $58 million of their money to go and invest it on their behalf was challenging. There are no other female deep tech funds in New Zealand, not the reason I wanted to start one. Um, it's one of our differentiators, and we've hired two female scientists to, to complement us. Um, but it is a barrier, it's an it's a invisible barrier, not just because of my gender, but also because of my age, and also because I haven't run a fund before. I can't go in and say, hey, I've done this once, I know what I'm doing. I went in much like Deb and Emma and Cleo and went, I know how to do this, and you just have to believe it. And that is a challenge to get people to buy it. And you know, we've obviously all succeeded in doing that, but that doesn't mean it isn't a challenge. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so what are the common problems you think are with early stage startups and startups? <laughs> I'm sure people say fake people. The ones who don't listen and um, the ones who, who think they're listening and then we give them feedback so they might say, yeah, the reasons we can't invest at the moment. But once you've addressed this, we'll have a um, look at the opportunity again and then they come back after six months, they're in the same place and they they haven't addressed anything else, but they've done everything else that makes their business more complicated, if that makes sense. So that's usually a challenge, um, and especially because we work with, and this is, how do you say this? Nice. I, I used to be a scientist, and I'm still a scientist, so I'll just say, we mostly deal with scientists and engineers, right? So they've been working in their labs, um, they've been working in their garage, making things. So when, when, when we give them feedback on the business, sometimes it's hard for them to understand what that means and why we're asking for that information. That's why the term shark tank. I mean, you know, the questions asked are quite similar and there's a reason for that. So we have to work really closely with them, take them to the journey, um, so we can't just they pitch to us and then wait for that. The challenge is, you know, bringing them up to speed with us, um, the time it takes to prepare them for investment. And the second part bit about that is we might like the business and opportunity, but just because we haven't seen the change of the person, we might have to turn them away, which is also really hard. So I think that's the biggest one for us, for, for me anyway. But now I'd, I'd just like to add to that yeah. the same one, which is that we invest in companies that often have more than one founder. Any of you guys working in teams or pairs? Yeah. yeah. So um, I've just written an article on it. It's called The Half-Life of Founders. And I admire you both for doing it on your own, because while it's hard, at least you don't have to deal with someone you've fallen out with. 
but really, really common in early stage companies is founder split. So it's all going well, we're great, we're going to do this thing. Suddenly you've borrowed somebody else's money, the pressure's on, the product's not doing what it's supposed to do, there's a hell of a lot of stress, and that's when we see founders split. And when founders split, half the intelligence goes into the party that left, and the other half stays, you end up with half the company. So that's a really key, key problem. It's one of the biggest challenges that we see in companies that are growing, is um, founders not sticking it through to the end, because they don't have the tools that they need to communicate with each other. Do you have a from common problems with early stage startups instead of couple? Yeah, um, I think one of the most important ones is product market fit. Um, uh, so this is probably usually once, say you've launched um, and you start to get feedback and you know, like, um, you're starting to put more things, whether that's, um, whether that's a non-technology business, like me trying to get the first few sales for my suits, um, or whether that's um, a technology business, which is, you know, for us getting more users on board. Um, um, one of the, the things we measure product market fit by is um, how disappointed people would be if you didn't exist tomorrow. Um, and getting a benchmark where enough people would be disappointed if you didn't exist tomorrow, um, and extremely disappointed, not just somewhat disappointed, um, it is actually really hard. Um, that means they have to care quite a bit about what you're doing, and getting a hundred people who absolutely rave about your product versus a thousand people who just kind of like it um, is actually a lot harder. Um, and um, I think people is yeah definitely a thing as well. Like we hiring um, like hiring the wrong person early on can make such a gigantic impact to your um, business. It's crazy. Um, and um, depending on the type of person you are and the type of team you build around you, um, contact for example. Um, me and Sophia, my co-founder, are both very chaotic people. Um, so uh, we need people who are organized around us. Um, if, if we don't have people who are organized around us, um, even though an early startup is chaos, um, it just feels even more chaotic um, over and over and over again. So um, when we look for people, seeing that they can at least be self-organized is pretty important to us. Okay. It's a great expression, but it's not very politically correct when I use it. Absolutely. So hiring the wrong person, um, rather than leading gap in your business, is better a hole than an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way you hire people. Not that much. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> all sounds like unicorns and rainbows, doesn't it? <laughs> Why don't all people do it? <laughs> um, okay, so I'll start with Steve on this one. How do you stay committed, especially when it's, what, minus... Yeah, we, we actually we had we had we had minus fifty with wind chill the other day. Uh, that was that was something new. Um, um, it's actually a, it's actually a really good question because you know as as a founder it's it's all down to self motivation. You know when you when you're working in an office, um, you know you wake up, you feel a little bit average, and you don't really feel like working. It's like well, too bad get into the office or else your boss will, you know, call you up screaming. So, you know, you've got that motivation by like management to get in you kind of like pushing you to do your job or else you won't have a job anymore. Um, in, you know, the case of being the founder, you know, it's it's all up to you. Um, so I think there, there comes a, an element of uh, uh, forgiving yourself for not being perfect. Um, you know, you can wake up and you can have a bad day and you can, Try and work, and literally you just stray on something like that. And you get to the end of the day, and you haven't achieved what you set out to do. If you bully yourself and bring yourself down for doing that and having those days, then you're going to dig yourself into a rut and continually lose motivation. Whereas if you accept the fact that you know, okay, you haven't had a great day. Tomorrow's a new day. You're gonna you're gonna put some plans in place, and you're going to do those. Then at the end of the next day, you feel great, and and, and you know that kind of spirals. Then that's going to facilitate a much more motivated, uh, or much much better internal motivation, and it's going to facilitate you being better long term. So I think it's like 
that acceptance that like human beings are not perfect. And as a founder, I am not perfect. I'm going to have bad days. That's, that's part and parcel. But you need to pick yourself back up and go, okay, if I don't work tomorrow, then potentially I'm going to miss out on a deal worth $100,000 a year to me, or I'm going to lose a client worth $80,000 a year to me because I'm not putting in the work to keep them. So it's, it really comes down to, you know, like my clients making sure that they're receiving, that they're getting value out of the work that I'm doing. And if I'm not, then, you know, all of my motivations are low, thinking, well, if I lose this client, then that's my business and my business alone. It's my responsibility. So yeah, that kind of like that acceptance that I'm not perfect, I'm going to have bad days, um, but also that, you know, like it is my business, it is my responsibility, so I've got to pick myself up, I've got to motivate myself because otherwise it's, it's my clients leaving and, and that's, that's kind of where the buck stops with me. Thank you. Cleo, how do you say my um, So actually, um, I lost all my motivation last year. Emma and I were actually discussing this. <laughs> um, I had burnout last year. Um, so my clients kind of saw it before I did it as well. They were having chats with me and being like, you know, like, you think you might want to slow down a little bit. But I was just so focused on like growing my business. It grew on like 400% since the previous financial year. So I was like, yeah, I've got to do that next year as well. And um, uh, you can ride the way for a really long time just on your adrenaline. Um, but that will burn out eventually. And um, I had hired someone that um, wasn't a good fit for the business, and even if you're on the day, and that ended up being like a $50,000 era, um, which, uh, so yeah, I was hugely motivated um, off running off that adrenaline, those highs from those sales. Oh my God, they're, they're like right up there, um, better than anything. Um, and then all of a sudden, just that there was this big dip with COVID and the, the recent lockdown having my son like with me every day, um, it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was the hardest thing ever. And for the first time I experienced um, no energy. Um, so in that moment, um, I actually thought about closing down a business because was, it, it was like to the point where I couldn't cope. Um, luckily I have a lot of support around me. So I think that, you know, when, if you do experience that, if something in your life happens, make sure that you have a really great support around you. It might even be your clients, which it was for me, like I rang some of them and was really transparent about what was going on and um, they were just like leave. So I left and um, came back uh, in January this year, um, super pumped because I took a whole month off and got really clear on what, why I'm in business, um, set a really clear direction um, and set some consistency around this year. So I have some consistent action points that I'll be um, achieving every day and every quarter. Um, so instead of like trying to, you know, take over the world in one day, I'm like, well, maybe I have 30 years to achieve and what do I want to achieve in that 30 years? So it took me, to, you know, it wasn't just the 50k that I lost, I lost heaps of um, client opportunities and things as well, but that was the cost of my learning experience as well. So I would say probably not went off on a little tangent there, but that strong network that you have around you, that's like everything to help you stay committed when you do lose that energy and that drive to continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah just echoing what the uh, first two have said, but I think definitely scheduling time, a uh, downtime. Um, over Christmas, for example, I just took three weeks off. <laughs> I definitely had a lot of work that I could be doing, but I allowed myself to just say, look, this is the time of the year that I'm going to be able to take this time off. Once we get back into the business year, I'm going to need to be working, so I give myself permission to have that, those breaks. And similarly, like on a weekend or something, I'm not going to feel guilty if I want to have a day or you know not work on my business all the time. Um, and then I think motivation comes from momentum. So yeah, as these guys have said, but you know when you're getting wins and when you're hitting sales and when you, it's amazing how much motivation comes from that. So if you're ever feeling like unmotivated for me, I, I look at my to-do list and I try and identify what are the things I can do that's going to give me that feeling or make me feel like I've made some progress, quick wins or working on sales, uh, closing a deal will always give you motivation, so um, those are probably two things. Take breaks when you need them and then yeah, try and focus on tasks that make you feel like you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's... Um just seeing entrepreneurs come and pitch every day. It's something, because we're in science engineering again, 
um, they're solving some of the world's greatest problems. You know, like one company we're looking at right now, trying to clear up um, junk in space from all the broken satellites that are hanging out. Then there's another one that we've put in the past, um, trying to diagnose heart disease earlier before someone has a heart attack. So when you come into the office, you know you're going to be meeting someone that's trying to change the world, not just themselves. Um, that's pretty exciting. Second is just being around my awesome team. Like, I know if I wake up, I'm tired, run down. As soon as I go in, there's laughter. <laughs> so having a good team around you for, for me as my manager and my um, other colleague. Um, but having the, that's why people are so important, to keep you guys on the level as well. Like, do you want to wake up and see these guys again <laughs> tomorrow? Um, and, uh, and, it, and from my like, entrepreneur's point of view, I'm not an entrepreneur, but my partner is, he wakes up every day because um, he's an engineer as well. He's like, I want to solve a problem that exists. And if I don't do it, if I fail, if I try and if I fail, maybe someone else um, can see this and have a go at achieving the same thing in a different way. So um, just surround, being surrounded by people who are just trying to change the world. Okay, now this is probably one of the questions um, that all of the students will be interested in, and we will do quite a bit of work on this at a, at a later time. But I thought I'd talk about your journey for raising investments. So, Dev, do you want to pick that one off? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, so I started the process of raising about six months after I first discovered the idea. This is the initial idea that I did um, sit along. Um, but 20, 20, sorry, uh, not six months, like three months. Um, I had created a pitch deck, which is essentially like something you use to present to investors or send them on an email to introduce your idea um, and sometimes your team and what the problem is and, um, and whatnot. Um, I paid one straight away. Um, because it actually sometimes helps you think through some of the logic that um, your business might be about. Um, and it forces you to think about the problem, forces you to think about the solution. Um, like there's another tool called Lean Business Campus, which is um, like another way of doing that. Um, but yeah, three months later, I, oh, I, I overnight um, made it with a WordPress website, or like I guess Wix or Shopify, like essentially made a landing page, so one page, which kind of um, was like sign up to this waitlist, um, and um, started building a waitlist, um, and got about like 200 people in two months or so, um, just posting on different Facebook groups, posting on my LinkedIn, um, and then I was like, okay, cool, there's demand for this. Um, let me go to investors. Um, so the last time I met Bill Smale was during Young Enterprise, maybe in 13. So I hit him up on LinkedIn, out of nowhere, being like, hey, don't know if you remember me. Um, and so I, I did that. Um, pitch. Oh, I, I just sent him the website. The website didn't work on mobile. He checked it out on mobile, and he was like, uh, yeah, the website doesn't work, um, but I don't think the idea is going to work. Um, and uh, essentially, for the next six months, my part-time job, um, while I was selling my, my suit business, was pitching um, to investors, all sorts of investors. Um, including friends, um, and yeah, 19 meetings later, I got Bill Smale um, to lead our round. Uh, to lead means to uh, have the most capital invested in that, um, unless unless it's a VC, sometimes it's different. But um, yeah, essentially, he, he put in to start with 100k, um, and then I told all my friends who were interested. Um, always like this, um, A bills invested, uh, would you be keen on investing? And then, yeah, I had the other 50% coming through friends and um, like, for example, Mike McRoberts was one of my investors because I made soup for him 
and he really believed in what I did. Um, uh, I had another person I met through Young Enterprise, um, uh, like a mentor. Um, so yeah, essentially just asked whoever I could um, who isn't going to be broke um, and they invest. And uh, took about nine months to close my round. Um, so yeah, nine months to close, 250,000, and then on a something called convertible note, uh, which means that you don't give part of the company straight away. It's based on a future value of the company. So it's not like Shark Tank where it's like, I'll take 5% for uh, $500,000. Um, it's based on a future value. So because, because the app wasn't, the app didn't even exist at that point. We had just built uh, something called the MVP, uh, which is a minimum viable product, um, just to prove that we could build it and that we could get a waitlist. Um, but there was no like proof that this was going to work, and and there was no uh, like money coming in and all that stuff. Um, so it was hard to determine a value to the company. Um, so yeah, I did that. Um, and then we actually did a slightly technical round where we raised money on two series, and so we just actually closed another bunch of money as well. So yeah. Oh, Stephen, what was your uh, investment journey like? Uh, yeah, so I, um, you know, the, my business has been profitable from day one. So, uh, and, and it being in the services, uh, service based industry, um, you know, the, the requirement to raise money to build a product was, was not there. Um, so what I did basically is, um, I reached out to the, the owner of the agency that I worked at in Melbourne, um, and just kind of said, Hey, listen, I'm thinking of, you know, starting my own thing. Can we catch up? Um, and just kind of, uh, you know, you can give me some advice around starting your own agency. Um, cause at that point, the, his agency was, I think 70 employees and, um, you know, like eight figures a year kind of thing in revenue. So, um, yeah, just reached out to him and said, Hey, listen, you know, um, I'd love your feedback. Um, after our meeting a few days later, he, he literally just went, reached out again and said, hey, uh, you know, would you like any help with actually getting this thing off the ground? Um, so yeah, the, uh, I said yes straight away. Uh, and there was obviously a few months of negotiation around how much of the business I was giving up and for what amount uh, and what his role was going to be in the business. Um, but yeah, you know, that it was it was really awesome to have a uh, someone on board who had done it all before and had scaled a business to you know eight figures in the space of uh, three or four years. Um, but came th again through through my network and through the fact that uh, you know worked really really hard and achieved some pretty awesome results while working within his business. So um, you know he he saw what I was capable capable of and he obviously backed the person I was that. The amount of money coming through the door at that time was not very much at all, um, but you know he, he backed me to you know to scale something up and create something that was um, you know going to achieve something. So yeah, it was it was you know not not quite as difficult as you know like a product based business which requires that 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 first kind of round of funding to actually build the product. You know, I had what I had my services. I had my product already there. It was just about kind of uh, you know, I suppose getting that funding to take it to the next step to pay for you know like the the different things required when when first setting up a business like new website, branding, everything like that. Um, yeah. advice and I came back and went actually I can help you with more, it's good. 
Your first round is often um, what we call Paul's family and friends. So let Dev's point is you went and raised from Paul's family and friends. The most important thing when you are raising a round, uh, and we found this too, is to find a lead. And a lead is someone who will say, yep, I'm going to back you. Either by giving you a term sheet, or by giving you a sum of money, or by promising to underwrite. So what I mean by that is, is um, if you don't raise a million, I'll make it up for a million. So if you don't raise 200,000, I'll make it up for 200,000. That's a very, very powerful sales tool to take out and go, I don't need your money, but you can come in if you want to. And people then invest much faster. So we actually got a lead who underwrote 25 million. Um, they actually put in 1 million themselves and said, go raise the 24. So um, I've pitched 143 times on my fund mm -hmm. to raise um, 57.9 million. So um, there's a lot of pitching, a lot of people say no. I've heard Cleo earlier say people say no to me 100 times a day. Me too, babe. <laughs> every time someone says no when you're pitching, I do the following. I say, I'm, I'm sorry it's not for you, that's great. Who can I speak to that you know that might be interested? So I try and get two introductions for every person who turns me down. So that way, every person I see, even if they say no, I'm like, great, twice the chance next time. Um, and that's how we've managed to raise the quantity of money. Um, yeah, so I'm professional services, so I don't have a product um, that people can see either. But um, when I was growing my team, I actually um, grew by growing the capital with my clients. So the way that we charge for our work is we get them to pay part of the fee up front. Um, and I looked in so many contracts that I was able to um, grow a whole heap of capital to invest in growing a team. And that's kind of my idea around when I'm growing, I just go and get a whole lot of future projects and line them up and then get the money on board so that I can grow. So it's another option. Um, just maybe, I know when you're buying out to raise investment for the first time, um, it feels like what you see on TV. Um, it's actually not Shark Tank everywhere. Um, just keeping in mind, 90% of the investors are actually quite interested in learning about what you're up to, and especially given your age, right. they might even make time to see you, more likely to see you than some of the other serial entrepreneurs that are out there. So just treat them like human and what my are saying you ask for advice, you might get money. Um, there's actually quite a lot of interest in supporting and backing young entrepreneurs. Um, you will see that more and more. Um, and if you look at Crimson as an example, uh, started by I think 16 or 18 year old um, uh, Jamie. And Having more examples of young entrepreneurs coming through has given investors more confidence. So don't shy away from them. Don't treat them like people who are super serious and they just have to give you. Um, uh, Ninety percent of them are super friendly and will just, you know, be happy to meet with you. And if something exists, then they'll invest. Um, from our side, just so you know that investors are here too. We also come to young deals, so we want to back the best companies. And for us, having a, having one of the best companies in our portfolio is sales for us. So that's what gets us really excited. So if you have something exciting, there might be other people that are fighting for you to have um, presence on your cap table that was before the luxury table. So just think of it from that perspective. So hopefully when you start your investment journey, it's not as daunting. Thank you. Yeah, that's the expression you'd be lucky to have. <laughs> So we're going to wrap it up with one last question, or not, it's not a question, but it's going to go to everybody. Is what's a key piece of advice you'd give all these young people starting their own businesses? Some of start with you, Stephen. Um, I would say, I would say, like, really identifying like what you're passionate about, and then identifying where there is a gap in the market for your passion and then going just full tilt at it with like, you know, just unmatched enthusiasm. Um, you know, like the, I think you, you can definitely, you can definitely be successful in a space which you're not enthusiastic about um, and, you know, you're not passionate about, but it makes it so much easier if you're working on something that you at least have some interest in, you know, like the, uh, most of us has come, have come from a background of, you know, maybe being involved in, you know, what we're doing now on like a kind of side note um, in, in like a previous full-time job. So we knew a little bit about it and we knew that that was what we were passionate about within that full-time role. It might have only been 5% of it, but we knew that we had some passion for that. So I think it's really, really important to find something that, you know, you are 
passionate about so that when you are you know feeling a little bit like you know unmotivated you know that there's something that really inspires you to be better to do better to work hard at um, because you've got that underlying passion for it um, so you know it, it, it might not be you know the, the absolute dream I wanted to be a professional footballer for pretty much all of my life um, and you know that was the dream um, definitely didn't pan out, uh, you know, 10 ankle injuries later and it's just, you know, never going to make it. I was talented enough, but it was the injuries, I promise. Um, but, you know, the, I, it was, I found something that I was passionate about. I went to university and I wasn't quite passionate about, like, the different things um, and hence why I dropped out of that. Um, you know, I started off in sales and realized that I was really passionate about people and talking to people and finding solutions for what people wanted and what people needed. Um, and then that kind of migrated across into, you know, like we've been really passionate about marketing and sales and technology. And then that kind of combined into the digital agency that I'm running today. Um, but, you know, without that underlying passion for those different for those different pieces of the puzzle, I don't think I would be where I am today. Where we feel like you're not good enough, 
um, you you know you might hear like in the media like there's like 16 year old or like 15 year old who's like starting a business or um, or whatnot. Um, uh, in my case, it was just that um, my strongest subject was business studies, but um, I was definitely not like a um, an excellent student. Um, I was like between between merit and excellence. Um, so that actually always played at the back of my mind, um, that I felt like academics um, was uh, not being the strongest academic would play to me not being the strongest entrepreneur. Um, and um, it's definitely not true. Like, and, and to be fair, I think that um, it, uh, one of the, it's cringe but, and it's cheesy, but um, I really think that the school's motto, I don't know if it's still the same, um, I think actually it, it means a lot to me, um, which is um, let courage be thy test. Um, because honestly, when, when you don't even believe in yourself, you just have to like literally just believe in uh, a concept. So, um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Now, I'm just looking at the time, it's 2.51. Does anyone need to sort of rush off before you oh, get to no, Okay, <laughs> so we'll do just a few questions and then we'll, we'll finish up. Anyone got any questions? I'm sure we, I, I'd like to think you've got lots and I will try and answer them over the next few days. If not, guess what? I'll be on the emails. <laughs> Thomas! So, you can have one. All right, now. okay, all right. Yeah, one for now, and then any more. Or else I'll just be on the one. Um, so, there are 168 hours in a week. How do you divide up your time between, you know, sleeping, eating, and then your business, and any other things that you need to do? <laughs> There's a question for everybody. So, so yeah, someone jump in and okay. I won't get everybody to answer. Okay, it, so uh, the most important part of my week is our daily exposure. I get up at 5.30 and I run for an hour, and that means I can do everything else in the day as well. And sleeping occurs when everything else has been done. I don't spend a lot of time eating, I'm not a foodie, so I can you know, take it a lot of time. She does not eat that yourself. But there is important to have a balance between working in your business and working on your business. That's the balance I want to differentiate. Am I building my business and strategically given how to grow it, or am I doing the selling and the production? Okay. And that's the balance that people lose. They talk about social life and work life, but they don't talk about in and on. And if you're not spending one day a week working on your business, you're doing yourself a massive injustice. So if you go for the 28 year old, where you're at least spending a fifth of your time working on strategic how to grow your business, then the rest of what you do, as long as you're exercising, you'll work out. Cool. Anyone else? Steve, I mean, just like really, really just um, just balance, you know, like uh, having a good night's sleep, uh, eating well, like you know, very cliche things, but like balance is key to success. You know, if you're if you're constantly doing one thing and one thing only, or even if you're just you're just working seven days straight for you know ninety hour weeks, you, you know you're going to burn out, like Theo, like what, what Theo was saying. So for me, it's just all about balance. It's making sure that like after spending two and a half hours in meetings, I go outside and I just like don't look at my phone, don't look at anything and just relax. That could be at 10.30 in the morning or something like that, but it doesn't matter. I just need some space to unwind. I need some space to reset my brain a little bit um, and, and then get back into it. So, uh, you know, the way I work, it's kind of like, you know, sprints of like really being really productive and then taking like a decent length break to kind of reset and get back into things. Um, so. Yeah, I think like sleep and, and then just like balance around like working and actually doing stuff, you know, you enjoy outside of work, being outside, you know, getting in nature, that kind of thing, going for a walk, just those kinds of things are so incredibly important to reset and then get back into being productive. Otherwise you just, you think you're being productive, but the reality is like, you, you just, your mind's straying left and right and you're not actually doing anything with a 30 minute task it might take two and a half hours because you haven't taken that time to reset. Can I also add another thing? Um, it's a more um, sort of managing your mental health as well, so staying connected with your people, so your parents, your friends. Sometimes you can just kind of, your time goes by working on your business or on your business and your business, everything is your business. Um, and I noticed that with my partner, when he started, months went by, months went by, I hadn't seen his friends and things like that. And then when he did see his friends, he'll talk about his business. <laughs> um, and once he started, started to change that pattern, and now the thing was a complete reset for him. So just 
sometimes it's one of those things you have to work out what's right for you. Yeah. yeah. Other questions for the panel while we've got them? Otherwise, we'll do an email. Come on. Uh, I mean, most of us in here, it's like our first startup. And so when we're looking for investors, most of us, I feel like, will be looking for expertise as well. Do you think that's important to like look for more expertise than your cash impact? Ask for advice and you'll get money. <laughs> always, always ask for advice mm -hmm. from everybody you meet before you ask them for money. Especially because of your age. Um, when searching for like a team member or someone to maybe like a co-founder or something, what would you look for? Um, so if you're looking for a team member or co-founder, what do you look for? Because we know like that another employee or so something. So I use Gallon Strengths um, and I design a person that I want to hire. Um, and I get, so HR is my background, so um, I, I'm really obsessed with this, which is quite ironic. <laughs> I actually consult companies on hiring staff, so my clients found it really hilarious. But, um, but that's kind of like the thing, you can get really stuck in you know, what you do and think you know best. Um, but yeah, I kind of like visualize the person that I'm looking for, what are my strengths, like what do I, where are the gaps, and where do I need to like fill someone in. And I am always open to looking for a, like a co-owner, um, and I'm quite clear on who that person would need to be, and I'm kind of open to that but not um, like strategically looking for anything so I so think it's like finding someone where are the gaps, what do you hate doing and you know, if you can create a role that someone really loves and enjoys, you can push off all of those like jobs that are draining your energy and sucking your time and pass it on to someone who would love that and get really energised from that yeah. I do um, like it's a lot of like self reflection into knowing what you're bad at so then you can uh, unload it onto someone else. Um, yeah, although I'm reporting you, if you find someone who is the opposite of you, who loves doing things you hate, then you might want to work with them. So the most important thing for a co-founder is someone you would want to work for and with. So someone you want to spend more time with. They have a different skill set to you, that's a huge bonus. But you, actually, you find people are very different from you, and sometimes it's quite hard to actually want to be around them. But the most important thing for also, also trust. trust. Just to say, the most um, important thing is trust. Like, trust, what he said. Yeah. Also, yeah, I, I, I think a huge thing is trust. You know, like there's so many businesses that fall because co-founders can't agree on something or, you know, there's been a breach of trust. Um, trust is huge. You know, the person that you're working with day in and day out and is, is going to be a co-founder with you, you need to trust that they have the best interests of the business at heart. Uh, they, you need to trust that they, you know, they trust you, um, and yeah, you know, it's it's so so important to, to trust that person who is starting this business with you. And also, like uh, tying in the people side to what's the next milestone you need to reach for your own business. Like you're starting now, what do you need help with, and then next so you attract the right skill set, I guess, um, and on top of the personality. There's been so many times where I've seen like people go and find their friends because yeah. I trust that person, um, but they trust them personally, not in a business way. They might not be able to help Ravi, so it just becomes a big weight <laughs> to your yeah. business and it's hard to get rid of them. Um, so also understand you know, what you need to achieve in the next six months, a year, two years. Is this someone you want long term or short term? Um, and always try before you buy. So get them to work with you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> before you yeah. Thank you. One more, let's do one more question. One more for now. Anyone else? Toby. How do you go about um, finding or like employing someone or contracting someone that you know nothing about? Like, yeah. So, we have a gallop on them. We run them through a personality profile assessment. We also run them through an intelligence assessment to make sure I'm not hiring someone who's stupid. It's not to do without that. Um, and we, we look at their approach to work and make sure that it's a match for our approach to work. So we actually run them through a professional system. It costs 160 bucks and it stops us hiring people who don't Yeah, so in terms of like something you also don't know about anything about what they like, are doing, to so say a sector that you, so you don't know anything about marketing, and getting someone into the marketing, how do you like find kind of the best person for the job? So yeah, it's just a There's a lot of skills. A lot of skills, yes. 
that you can run per per um, category or, or per job function. You know, like uh, the, like Dev's probably done this. If you if you're hiring developers, you run them through like a pretty intensive development course. You're hiring like a marketing strategist, then you get them to construct a marketing strategy for a new brand. Um, so you know you can create. A, a workflow um, that you know is very difficult for them to kind of fudge or to for them to do without having some some decent skills in the space. And you bring their references, and you ask their references why they were what they were better, and if they were hard again. Right. I would actually um, uh, what I do is I'm usually hiring the, like contractors for work that I don't know anything about. Like when I'm consulting, I actually know about the area really deeply, so I know. What I do is actually find someone who works in that space and I ask them, what do I need? Tell me everything that you know about this role. And I've asked friends, I've asked, like, just find anyone, find someone on LinkedIn and just anyone that will help you um, and just get them to help. And you can even, um, I've actually invited someone to help me debt before, um, so you don't have to do it all yourself. You can ask them to help. Awesome, great question. So we'll wrap it up uh, from me before um, Michael says a few words. Yeah, I'm an educator, I'm not, a, I'm not an entrepreneur, I've, I've been in this space for far too long, um, but I've learned a huge amount today, but the beauty of it is too is you know, a lot of the stuff you are talking about, we've already started discussing, so I'm slightly more confident that maybe my course is actually, you know, going on the right track, I don't think I've gone left field completely. Um, so from me, thank you so much for coming in um, and being pretty good first event and all the technology work in. Thank you, Stephen. So Michael, so part of the program to build um, confidence and networking ability is the students run it. So I had, there was a roster, so I had two students gone pick up the guests. I asked Stephen, they would have picked you up if you'd been here in person. And then uh, one of the students is responsible for, for thanking guests as well. So first up today was was Connor and Michael, they brought our guests over and I said the two of you, you decide who's going to do the thank you and what do you know, it's gone to Michael who is actually our head boy this year, so Michael, the floor is yours my dear. Uh, um, on behalf of all the lads, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you guys for just coming out here during the day and taking time out your businesses and what you're doing today. Um, and I am more than confident that everybody's here has actually taken something out of what you said. So thank you so much for your wisdom, your advice, your knowledge, and your, and your expertise. It was actually really interesting listening to um, either old boys or um, people that have basically gone down different routes in their jobs and, and led them to where they are today. So thank you so much. Awesome.